Good morning, everybody. Good morning. A very warm welcome to uh, St. Mary's this morning. Lovely to be able to welcome you here uh, for worship and for a service of Holy Communion. Uh, I'm going to say this at the beginning. Uh, I might have to say it again later for those who sort of come in late, but I wanted to sort of lay it out now. Uh, When it comes to communion today, uh, the Church of England has said that it's okay to go back to the use of common cup if you feel it's safe to do so. Uh, We do, in some senses, feel it's safe to do so, but we don't feel it's safe to share the cup as in drinking from the cup. So what we're going to do uh, as a bit of a holy experiment, it worked really well at St. Mark's last week, so I hope it works well here as well, is that when it comes to communion later on in the service, uh, you'll make your way up, uh, this this won't be here, don't worry, we'll move that out of the way. Uh, You make your way up to the main altar rail, sanitizing your hands on the way, there's a hand sanitizer there. Uh, You will receive your wafer and hold on to it, And then when the chalice comes to you, you'll just dip your wafer into the chalice. Does that make sense? Uh, Hopefully we think that's safe. Uh, It certainly felt safe at St. Mark's. It felt like the right way to do it. People were very, very pleased to be receiving wine again in any way. Um, So we hope it will be a blessing to you. Uh, So just receive the wafer. If in your journey of faith, as always, you feel it's more appropriate to receive a blessing, then indicate it to us. Now, there are kneelers. on the altar rail so if you can kneel on a kneeler then you'll be spaced out it will take a bit of a while to get us all there but we'll have some worship whilst we do it uh, and other things to enjoy as well if however you feel that for you that's not safe or something you'd rather not do then obviously absolutely that's fine you can either just receive the bread as you have been doing uh, or just come up for a blessing whichever you prefer however you feel most comfortable and however you feel most safe uh, is how we want you to receive uh, this morning when it comes to communion but i hope it makes sense anyway uh, and we'll we'll see how it goes later Uh, Let's just take a moment of stillness and quiet to prepare our hearts and minds to meet with God together in this place, to thank him for his presence with us, to acknowledge those times that we've fallen short of his desires for us, to confess those things before him. And we say together the words, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We thank you for your forgiveness and your love and your mercies new every morning. And we pray that you'd assure us of those things in this place at this time. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And we stand to sing together our opening hymn, To God Be the Glory.
please do take a seat. So we're going to uh, share in communion together, um, which is a real joy and a delight to be able to do, to remind ourselves of what Jesus has promised us, uh, what he's given for us, what he's done for us, who he is to us, uh, and to celebrate that together in bread and wine. Uh, for those of you who've just joined us late, to say that we are going to be receiving both bread and wine this morning, and we're asking you, as you receive your wafer, uh, we're going to be receiving at the, the rail. Sanitize your hands on the way up. As you receive the wafer, hold on to it, and then you'll be dipping it into the wine as the chalice comes to you. Uh, we feel that's uh, the safest way to be doing it right now, but good to be able to do both uh, this morning. Uh, the words you need for communion will be coming up on the screen. We'll be sharing this together, all ages together, and then children will be going to the groups after communion. And so as we gather together, we acknowledge that the Lord is here. His spirit is with us. And so lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. And so as we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit afresh upon us in this place, that we know that you are with us and in us, but would you increase our awareness of you in our lives. And that as you send your spirit, we ask that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of, our, of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. And so, with your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. And as our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And so we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. And so the invitation is to draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for you and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. So just to confirm, you will make your way uh, through here, sanitising on the way, kneeling at the kneelers. If you are a family bubble, you can uh, stand together uh, and we'll administer communion to you as a family. And then if you could make your way out through the Covert Chapel, back to your seats, that would be really helpful, just to have a bit of a one-way system, uh, if that's okay. 
uh, but come and receive with thankful hearts. Thank you.
Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. And when the time comes, would you send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Amen. If I can encourage you to take a seat. Um, Our children and young people are going to make their way to their groups. So if you are under 10, uh, then if you make your way through to the Covert Chapel with Becky, uh, and she'll be having some activities for you to do there. If you are 10 or over, uh, then if you make your way down to the Forge with Jan, uh, then she has some things for you down there. Our, Our children's groups are optional. If you'd rather your children stay in with you, that's absolutely fine. Very welcome to do so. But those who want to make your way, go with our blessing. May you know God's peace and presence as you learn more of him, as you share together in community. And may we know that too here in Jesus' name. Amen. Brilliant. So as they go to their groups, uh, we have, uh, for those of you who are new to St. Mary's or uh, visiting us, uh, we have a number of people that we support who work in the mission fields around the world, globally, locally, uh, a number of different places. And uh, we normally take it in time to sort of hear from each of our mission partners so that we can be updated with what they're doing. Full confession here, we've been really rubbish at that over the past year. Really rubbish at making time for it, and uh, I can only say sorry for that, not make excuses or reasons, but I'm just sorry, Uh, and the staff team is sorry, but we want to make amends, and so over the next few weeks, you're going to be hearing from a number of them. Last week, of course, we commissioned Asha and and Dami into the role in the hardware store, Uh, and today, we're going to hear from the Hawksley family, so I'm going to invite uh, Barbara and Phil, I don't know if Tim and Misha are coming up as well, they're staying where they are, but Barbara and Phil are going to come up, update us for a few minutes on where they're at, what they're doing, and how we can pray for them, and how we can support them. Uh, We support our mission partners financially and in prayer, uh, and so uh, let's hope that this is a time where you are informed of both. So we have our timer, just in case you wonder why I have a phone up here, (laughs) so we don't take the whole morning. For God so loved the world... So yes, yeah, so this is God's world, and um, probably in my house that's my favorite item because I don't know. I just kind of look at it and I think, wow, that's God's world, and um, it's also the apple of His eyes. He loves His world. Um, so yeah, for God so loved the world, and um, so the. I think what what we want this morning is explain what we're doing, but I think mainly is we would like people to understand the heart behind why we do what we do. So hopefully it's more than information, hopefully it's something that touches people's hearts. So I'm going to put my globe on the floor. So the, the last 18 to 24 months have been really, really busy in our house. And um, so, as you know, we're involved in missions, both with St. Mary's and with uh, Youth with a Mission and with the University of the Nations. So, equipping God's people for acts of service. And this is a fantastic verse. I'm sure you know it as well. But how then can they call on the one they have not believed, believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear it without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? And I really like that verse because I I kind of continue it in my mind. I'm like, unless they are sent. And how can they be sent if there's no one teaching them? And how can anyone teach them if nobody prepares a curriculum somewhere to be taught? And how can we prepare a curriculum if we don't know what the needs are? And how can we reach everyone unless we're together, unless we're strategic, unless we think about it, unless we have kind of a a proper altogether vision? So that's a very good verse. Mm -hmm. So I have basically four jobs in um, Youth with a Mission. So the first one is I'm the registrar to the uh, University of the Nations for West Africa and Central Africa, basically the Francophone Africa. The only ones I do not do is um, North Africa, 
for obviously safety, safety reasons and that. But you can see on the map the, the blue the blue bits are the French-speaking nations in Africa. So my job is, <clears throat> there's lots of different schools that the University of the Nations is giving, and I've just put a few up there to show you. There's, for instance, performing arts, discipleship training schools, counseling schools, community development schools, aqua, aquaculture, sustainable agriculture, environment, resource stewardship, King's Kids, there's just lots and lots of different schools. And basically my job is that I have about 33 YWAM bases and they would contact me, tell me which, um, which school they're running and I check, make sure, okay, everything's filled properly and then I send it to the appropriate college who checks the content. Obviously it's taught by experts in their fields and they check the content, make sure it's okay, and then they run their schools. And um, the, the guy on the right is a really good friend of ours, and uh, I j we just love him to bits, and, and his heart is for the kids in his village. They're not necessarily homeless, but they're so, so poor. Like, he sends us pictures. He's, I've never seen such a level of poverty. And, um, <clears throat> but his heart is to train, to know how to look after them. So last Friday, he took a bus that took two days to get there, where he's now attending a school something, I can't remember the exact name, but something to do with families. And then he will come back to look after these exact children from his village. So, but basically those schools, they exist to bring Jesus in every single sphere of society. And I think that's important to understand. So during COVID, I had quite a bit of time on my, well, actually, no, I didn't. I was quite busy, but in the same time, it was kind of a different kind of busy, where you're busy, but at your desk, not going anywhere. And um, I came across this amazing ministry of YWAM called Extension Studies, and I was looking at it, and I thought, what a shame, it's all in French. And my, all my people, like you, you've seen on the map, they can't access it because they're not bilingual, most of them. Or if they are, it's definitely not English and French. It's like lots of different languages and French. And uh, so I got in touch with the guy from the King's Lodge in, in England. And I said, would you mind if I translated your website into French? Because it's, it's really it's amazing what you're offering. And of course he agreed, so I translated over a few months his websites. And then, because of that, he said, well, how would you feel about um, pioneering extension studies in a French-speaking world, as in kind of globally? And first I wasn't too keen because I thought <laughs> that should be too big. And, but when I prayed, I really felt, yeah, this is the right thing to do. So I pray and I say, Jesus, I need one person to help me because I need a team, ideally of three of us. And I prayed and the name of this guy came in my heart and I hadn't seen him in about a year. And really who I was looking for, I was looking for somebody who kind of thinks strategically, who is godly, who is sold out for Jesus, who loves people, who has a servant heart. That's kind of what I was looking for. And... Um, so his name came to mind, so I contacted him. I don't know what it's going to look like, but how do you feel starting a team with me? We're going to pioneer this work in the French-speaking world. Raise the um, profile of extension studies. I'll tell you in a minute what they are. And um, he, his, I mean, his reply just totally blew me away because it was all by emails, of course. And he emailed me back with this massive document saying, do you know what, five years ago, I was really seeking God, and I felt Jesus speak to me about starting an extension studies center in my town. And I didn't know what to do with it, so I've set it all up in paper. So he sent me all the documents. It was like all set up, his vision, his mission statement, his how he was going to raise money for this, and basically the whole thing was done. So it's crazy, I think, how, you know, how God can see from heaven. He was like, okay, you're in England. I mean... To me, this comes back to this, you know, God, he's like holding on to the world and he's like, okay, you're here and there's someone over there with the same vision. Yeah, I, I can put you in touch together. <laughs> so, so yeah, I do love my globe. And uh, so God had seen, so on um, two, what's it today, Sunday, on Monday, it was the official lounge. So basically Extension Studies, it's um, a program that, kind of targets people who, who are professionals and who don't necessarily have six months to take out of their lives to go and 
and take a six month school of residential school. So they come maybe once a week, twice a week, and they are trained by people who are experts in their fields. And if you want to pray, I need a third person. And I have it on my heart to find it in Quebec, because then we would have one in Africa, one in Europe, and one in Quebec, and that would be so cool. So I haven't found anyone yet in Quebec. <laughs> Quebec is quite big. Um, okay, that, that's something else that happened as well during COVID, is that we became aware that a lot of French-speaking YWAM bases, as in globally this time, kind of feel a bit isolated. So that's just another team we started as well during COVID to um, communicate. And again, we've started a website. This time it's all in French. So they can pull their resources together to be more efficient. This was um, this is a screenshot from my computer, because of course we're not able to to meet in person. So we had I don't know how many Zoom meetings, uh, but this one was absolutely amazing. It was um, the global YWAM conference, like literally every uh, around the globe. So some of us it was like four in the morning, some of us it was midday. So it was like really kind of you can still be jet lagged even though you're not traveling, <laughs> and. Um, so I, was, I had the privilege of translating for these uh, three days of meeting, and there was like over a thousand participants behind their screens. It was, it was crazy, and it was translated in about, um, I think, five, four or five different languages through the different channels, but French was the, the channel at the front where everyone could hear. So, yeah, it was a long, it was very long, it was about four hours. But, um, yeah, the, the theme of the conference was repent, rem no, was remember, repent, realign, and release. And I think that's really something important if we don't want to lose our cutting edge into the things God's calling us to do, to all constantly like, you know, think, okay, what did Jesus say about this thing? What did, is he calling me to do? And then you remember, and then you repent for the things where, you know, life does, is quite busy, so we kind of lose track of our focus sometimes. So you remember, and then you repent, and then you realign yourself, and then you released. So that was the theme of the YWAM conference, and that was really, really beautiful. So yeah, so that, that's the, the fourth thing I'm involved with, is tons of translations, live written and oral interpretations and translations. Right, and, and when God says, go into all the world, well, that includes Hankras. So that's uh, Phil's bit. Right, so... Um uh, the heart of YOM is to serve internationally, obviously, but it's, it's also to serve locally. And so um, that is more my sort, 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 sort of thing. Um, over, over the years, that has looked like sort of children's ministry and schools work. But um, recently, I've, I have a real heart to see, to see All Saints revived and, and to see a worshipping community there, so um, that is sort of my sort of big heart at the moment towards uh, missions. Um, so with that, I decided to um, to take on some theological study. So I've been doing a part-time course at St Melitus up in London. So uh, St Melitus College is a college that's come out of HDB in London. Um, so they've converted a a huge old church into a, a centre for study and worship. Um, so that's where I spend my Tuesdays up there uh, studying, and it's been it's been really great. I've been able to tailor my studies to the situation here. So I've been looking at rural mission and uh, things like that, how to do mission in a rural setting. Uh, so, so in that time, as you know, I've been sort of holding the hardware together until Asher and Dami arrived, <laughs> which has been a real joy um, just to be able to get involved in the community some more, sort of get to know people more and uh, be part of that. Um, that picture was taken on my last day on Friday, so, so I'm no longer sort of officially in the shop. Um, so, so Ash is on his own now. So, um, yes. Yeah, so, um, 
I will still be um, studying um, sort of part-time. I've also been offered another job locally at an agricultural college as a lecturer, so, so I'll be doing that, but uh, very much uh, the heart to see all saints revived and to see some, some worshipping um, community established in there. So, so that's me. Okay, that's it. So no, that's us. <laughs> so yeah, I think like if you, if you do pray for us, the main thing is just pray that our hearts really stay close to Jesus because there's so many things that that are happening, but at the end of the day, it's by your heart. Like, if you do it because you love Jesus, because you want people to know Jesus, then everything else falls into place. So I think pray for our hearts that Jesus continues to protect our hearts. Now we love him more and more, and now it's all by him at the end of the day. So that's it. Thank you. Brilliant. We'd love to, um, if you stay there for now, because we're going to do something a bit different. Uh, just to say one thing, Phil mentioned that he's um, starting a new part-time job. Uh, that actually starts tomorrow. So uh, we'd love to obviously pray specifically for that. Uh, I don't know, he's feeling excited and nervous in equal measure probably. Um, so to pray for that. Um, and what I thought we'd do is that there's a beautiful verse that talks about singing to each other psalms, songs, and spiritual songs. Um, so what I'd love is we're, we're going to worship, but as we worship, I'd love people to gather around Phil and Barbara and pray for them if that's okay. So if you guys want to make your way kind of more to the middle, um, and as we sing, as we celebrate and worship together, let's pray for Phil and Barbara and release them. Obviously, Tim and Misha and Amy and Grace as well. Um, pray for them as a family. Um, that would be great. So let's stand to sing and to pray and to worship together. Let's encourage each other with spiritual songs.
Jesus, you are all to us, and we thank you that we um, have the privilege of, of working with you for your kingdom, for the building of a kingdom. And so we release Phil and Barbara and their family in the name of Jesus to do what God has called them to do for such a time as this. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I said to um, Phil and Barbara this morning, uh, take as long as you need to share, as long as you want to share, and I'll plan my talk accordingly around it and and sort of fit in uh, what we kind of feel is important. We are looking uh, today in Luke chapter 6, verses 17 to 26, which I'll just read uh, through now. I think it will be possibly on the screen as well. So Luke chapter 6, verse 17. Here, Jesus went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coast of Tyre and Sidon who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by evil spirits were cured and the people all tried to touch him because the power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, "'Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God.'" Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their fathers treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, you who have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. I need this for a quote later, so I don't want to lose that. So this um, really, uh, what is essentially uh, Mark's brief summary of the Sermon on the Mount, which we have a much fuller account of in Matthew, has so much in it that it would be uh, warranting a sermon series in itself. A sermon series that I'm sure many of you have heard before. Sermon series on the Beatitudes, and uh, really important that we do that because they are uh, the teachings of Jesus so fundamental to, to what we believe and what we do. And, and summarizing this in the space of a few minutes, this even even just these few verses, is a really hard thing to do. So uh, before I speak, I'm offering to you an invitation because there are things that I'm going to say that only begin to scratch the surface of such important verses. And there are things I'm going to say that may cause more questions than answers. And so I'm inviting you on Wednesday at one o'clock, I'm going to be in All Saints and we're just gonna st- I'm just going to study this passage. And if you want to join me in studying this passage, join me on Wednesday, All Saints, one o'clock, just to see what God is saying through through these verses because I can't cover it all in a sermon and it's too important to just gloss over. Uh, so I, if you're available on Wednesday during the day, one o'clock, come to All Saints and we'll look at it together. Uh, but I want to draw out just two of the themes uh, this morning. I want to look at the theme of persecution and the theme of integrity and see how those two things are so closely linked. And actually we've just been singing about it as well, which beautifully brings it together as well. There are, through the generations, uh, so many people claiming to be prophets who speak over this country that persecution is coming. And I'm not the one to judge whether or not those people are prophetic, but they are there, and they speak this, this coming, this promise of a coming persecution. And actually, we know that persecution is something that Jesus guarantees uh, will come. It is something that we, uh, at some point, I'm sure, in some way, will all face. But it's important that we understand uh, what persecution is and what persecution isn't, to to recognize when we see it around the world. Because I think often people uh, assign things to persecution that are not persecution. And doing so is massively disrespectful to our brothers and sisters in Christ who are genuinely facing persecution. And I think it's really important we understand the difference of what persecution is and what it isn't, uh, particularly in this nation. And I found this quote that was really helpful that I thought, actually, do I think that we are in a time of persecution uh, now as a nation? And actually, I, I don't think we are. But I think this quote sums up where we are at really well. While the church is not an ethnic minority, and it's important to clarify that, we are what sociologists call a cognitive minority, meaning as followers of Jesus, 
our worldview and value system and practices and social norms are increasingly at sharp odds with those of our host culture. We face constant pressure from both the left and the right to assimilate and follow the crowd. I think that's a summary of where we're at. I think it's a really helpful, honest summary of where we're at. But it's not persecution. Being told to wear a mask in church is not persecution. Being told to worship at home is not persecution. That's really disrespectful to our brothers and sisters whose lives are at risk on a daily basis for believing in Jesus. And persecution is something that when we look at it from a kingdom perspective needs to be understood because persecution, and when people kind of prophesy about persecution, I, I sometimes get this undertone of fear and anxiety or worry that comes along with it or fear or shame or whatever it may be. And fear and shame are things that have no place in the kingdom of God with except for fear of the Lord. So if persecution is of the kingdom of God, which we know it is because Jesus is preaching about it in the Sermon of the Mount, there should be no fear and shame related to persecution at all. And we have to remember that, that Luke is writing this at a time where pure persecution is rife in the church. Luke, as the gospel writer, is recounting the words of Jesus when persecution is happening around him, and he writes word for word what Jesus says, that when persecution comes... Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. I mean, come on, what? <laughs> Jesus, what are you talking about? Rejoice in that day and leap for joy? That's not how the world would see persecution. But it's very clear that we need to understand that he's not saying rejoice that persecution is happening. Don't rejoice in the persecution. Persecution is not a jolly. It's not fun. There's nothing enjoyable about it. But what he's saying is rejoice at what's on the other side of it. Rejoice that your inheritance is a promised inheritance. That even death itself has no victory over you. Rejoice that this is happening because A, you have a promised inheritance on the other side of it, but also rejoice because this is what has been said is going to happen for a particular reason. And I think there's something important we need to understand in our heads that when it comes to rejoicing and leaping for joy... Not at persecution itself, but what's on the other side. Because we need to understand a fundamental truth that came to me this week. And I believe and I hope and I pray this is from God. I'm not claiming that this is prophetic, don't worry. But I just had a real sense of this, of God saying to me personally, that we need to understand that in the kingdom of God, persecution is not a punishment from God on the church for what it's doing wrong. It's an affirmation that it's getting it right. It's an affirmation that the church is getting it right because it means the church is standing up and speaking for Jesus to a society that can't accept him, that can't receive him, which we knew would happen. Jesus would say that people would reject him. And so what we need to understand is that when society, when the world is threatened by the way of Jesus and his lordship, it wants to reject Jesus and push him out. And the only way it knows how to do it is to reject those who represent him on the earth. Which should be us. So if persecution comes and suffering comes with it and remembering what we spoke about about a year ago that, that in suffering we see the glory of God that is in sharing in his suffering we see his glory the most. We can rejoice knowing that it's an affirmation that we're doing the right thing. When I was at college, uh, the Bishop of Uganda came over to our college to speak to us at a time where persecution was rife in Uganda. The church was under serious, serious threat, but it was growing, thriving. And when he shared his story of what was happening in Uganda, it was asked of him, how can we pray for the church in Uganda? His response Oh, don't pray for us. The church is fine in Uganda. It's growing and thriving. Pray for yourselves where the church is too comfortable. <laughs> I think that's really powerful. Really powerful words from him. Because we know that where persecution is happening, the church is growing. And thriving because people are standing up for Jesus. And the question that the students of this nation are asking... Does it work? Does Jesus work? 
The answer is yes, he works. And he's at work. And so if and when persecution comes, we shouldn't be fearing. We should be ready to rejoice in what's promised beyond it and see it as an affirmation that we're standing up for Jesus enough. And that is where integrity comes into this as well and why it's so important for us as Christians to basically say that if we are saying that we are a Christian, it means we're following Jesus. 100%. As we've been saying so many times over the past few weeks, following Jesus is not a hobby. It is our entire way of life. And either he means everything to us or he means nothing to us. He can't mean anything in between. He is our all in all. And so if we are saying we are followers of Jesus, then we are followers of Jesus full stop. And he is our priority, our number one in life. And then he goes on to list those four woes. Uh, the woe to you who are rich, for you've already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed, you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh, you will mourn and weep. Uh, woe to you who sp when men speak well of you. He's basically saying all these things that, that offer the, the illusion of life and enjoyment and freedom will all fall away. None of them will stand. But Jesus will. Jesus stands. And he's calling us into that deeper relationship with him. Where these things around us don't matter so much. They don't matter to us as much as he does. That he is, as we've just been singing, our priority, our number one, our all in all. You see, whether or not persecution is coming imminently or in years to come, the response is still the same. We can't be responsible for the whole church and how it's acting or behaving in this nation. We can't be responsible for a particular denomination of the church and how it's acting and behaving. And we can't even really be responsible for other people and how they're acting and behaving. And we certainly can't judge how they're acting and they're behaving. It's not for us to say whether a church or individuals are blowing hot or cold or lukewarm or whatever. Only Jesus has that judgment. Nobody else has that right. The one thing in this world Jesus did not outsource was his judgment. He outsourced his love, his compassion, his kindness, even his miracles, his power, his glory. All of those things he outsourced to his church. But judgment is reserved for him alone. He's the only one on the throne who can do that. We cannot the only thing we can do is focus on how we're doing with Jesus. Whether persecution is here today or not, the response is the same. Be with Jesus, be like Jesus, do what Jesus does. It's our daily discipleship, it's our apprenticeship to him, that's who we are about, what we are about. And we can't do anything other than I'd say these three things. Help ourselves in our apprenticeship to Jesus, as in be responsible for our own discipleship. Help those around us with their discipleship to Jesus. And here's the third one, probably the one we find hardest. Help, accept help from others when we need it for our discipleship to Jesus. So the only things we can be responsible for, ourselves. And when persecution comes, whatever it looks like, however it appears, whatever it feels like when it's in it, we won't rejoice that we're being persecuted, but we can rejoice in what's the other side of it and rejoice that the church is being honoured for standing up for Jesus. Because it's not us that's being rejected, really, when that happens. It's Christ in us that's being rejected. Christ in us, the hope of glory. I'm not the one to say whether the prophets are speaking truth or not. I'm not the one to say when the hour will be, when the day will be, because I don't think that's for us to judge. But I want to be sure that when it happens, I'm with Jesus, I know Jesus, I'm trying to be like Jesus, and I'm doing what he does. Because that's the same whether we're in persecution or not. It doesn't change. Following Jesus is more than a hobby. 
And I want to ensure that he is my everything, my all in all, as we've just been singing. I'm going to leave it there. Uh, and I'm just going to allow the Holy Spirit for a moment to do what he needs to do. Let's just, um, just be still in this moment. Oh, Holy Spirit, thank you. You know, there's a work that, that we are responsible for in ourselves, but there's so much, God, that only you can do in us. That, that desire you have from us to go from glory to glory is, is, is largely a work of the Holy Spirit, and our call is to just invite him to do his work amongst us, to be open to that. And so as we seek to be with Jesus, be like Jesus and do what he does, we pray, Holy Spirit, would you infuse us? Would you fill us to overflowing? And if, you, if you're here this morning feeling condemned in any way, see that condemnation as not a condemnation of who you are or what you're doing or anything, but an invitation from Jesus to say, get to know me better. Come to me. Learn my way of life. I so desire to be your one thing. I so desire to be your main thing. So lay aside what hinders you and come. And let's see what we can do together for the kingdom. I just feel that this morning is, is a, a line in the sand moment of saying it's a, a chance to re-surrender to the way of Jesus. And so if, you, if you're here this morning and you want to re-surrender to the way of Jesus, can I invite you to stand where you are? Just as a sign of saying, Jesus, here I am, here's my all. I, I stand and I surrender to you. Jesus, may we be with you. May we be like you. May we do what you do. May we help ourselves in our own discipleship. May we help those around us in their discipleship. May we accept the help of others when we need it in our own discipleship. For the building of your kingdom and to the glory of your name. The name of Jesus, which we proclaim. The name that is above every name. The name at one day at which every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And we make that confession this morning. Jesus is Lord. <coughs> Amen. Let's remain standing to sing our, our final hymn this morning. Oh Jesus, I have promised if during this you want prayer for anything to uh, come and find me or someone else to pray with you, and that'd be great. Let's stand to sing. And if someone could go down to the forge, please, and let the kids know we're ready for them to come back, that'd be great. Thank you.
Um, please do be seated for a moment. Just a couple of things by uh, way of notice. Um, All Saints tonight, 6.30 for uh, worship and prayer. Do join uh, Phil and Barbara there if you are around 6.30 tonight at All Saints. As again, on Wednesday at 1 o'clock, you're invited to come and join me uh, to have a look at that passage in a little bit more detail together. Um, If you want to join me at All Saints on Wednesday at 1, uh, you're welcome to do so. Um, uh, There was another thing, but I can't remember what it was. Uh, So I'm sure it will come to me in a moment. Um, Yeah, so just um, want to encourage you uh, as you kind of journey through life that if you do feel that you need help with your discipleship, uh, then do ask somebody. Ask somebody to come alongside you, to walk with you, to journey with you. Uh, If there's passages you don't understand, then maybe just sit down with somebody over a coffee and and share in that and, you know, uh, know, just allow someone to help you if it's something that you need. Or if there's somebody you think God is calling you to come alongside, then give them a call this week and arrange to have a coffee uh, and journey alongside them as you read the word together and study together. Um, uh, yes, the other thing, uh, Handcross Community Pantry, uh, we restarted the cafe element of the pantry last week, which started really, really well, really encouraging to see people gathering together again in that space and to share in community. Uh, we got a really good number of uh, volunteers helping with packing bags and, and greeting people, and that's great, um, but we would really dearly love some more volunteers to help in the kitchen. So if you would be happy on a Saturday between 10 and 11.30 to come and help make teas and coffees, um, maybe just once a month or something, then either speak to myself or Barbara Bufoy. Uh, We'd love to have you involved in that ministry as it continues to grow and thrive and flourish. Uh, And do please continue to donate to that as well, either financially or through the hardware store with items. Uh, It's always greatly appreciated. Let's pray God's blessing as we draw this time of worship to a close. If you want to pray with anyone, do grab them uh, after the service. We ask that the peace of God which thankfully passes all human understanding, (laughs) may keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and in the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us, with those we love, with those we could love better, today and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. I might change that. Go in peace to know Jesus, to be with Jesus, to do what Jesus does. Amen.